You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. And I'm here with my little bro, Chris Reynolds. Thanks for being on the show. And we're here to talk really about one of your favorite topics, I think. This is one of the ones you've been looking forward to in the queue. And that is how to pay attention, or maybe better put, how to learn to ignore the rest of the bullshit that's sort of taking up attention. That's right. I think it's one of those core skills. It's like an early core skill. And I wish it were taught like in schools. I just think that everybody benefits so much from learning how to do this better. I think if you look at your kids, if you have kids, if you look at your kids, they start really, really bad at this, right? Sure. (laughs) Like just the ability to focus on one thing for an extended period of time is just not something that we're born with. We've got to learn to do that. That's right. But in today's world with distractions at literally every possible place, every conceivable location, it's even harder. And most people don't notice it. They don't realize their brain is jumping from thing to thing to thing. And you're paying for those contexts, which is by basically not getting all the information that you could get. And also it makes you totally exhausted. Yeah, absolutely. People don't know it. Yeah, it's interesting. Certainly some of this is genetic, right? Like there are some people who obviously have sort of natural dispositions towards attention deficit disorder type thinking. I know that's not me. I would assume that you'd say the same thing. That's not you. But it doesn't mean that we all can't benefit from learning how to get better at this thing. And so when I think about the distractions that my kids, especially as when they were younger, your kids are younger than my kids, you know, you've seen the stats about how often the TV changes cameras now or angles on the TV. Like, you know, you'd see single shots. Like, I remember reading, I took a film class or a couple of film classes in college in the old Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. Do you know that there's a scene for 30 minutes where the camera never cuts? 30 straight minutes of a single camera. And now it's like literally like every two seconds, every second and a half, you see these camera cuts. And so, That has changed dramatically. When I think about when I was forced to start to do this, I don't know if you have the same memory as I do because you were, you know, you're three years younger than me, but our dad was in seminary and he would take us to chapel when it was big seminary, right? It was a great big room. And you had guys that were going to school to be preachers, preaching often back to back or even back to back to back sermons. And of course, all these preachers, they want to impress all their other preacher friends by preaching longer and more in depth. And I was five and you were two and we would have to sit in these chapel services often for like three hours. And we're talking about Southern Baptist in Memphis in the South, like nothing exciting, no exciting music, no laser light shows. There weren't landing helicopters on the stage, all that fun stuff. There weren't smoke and pyrotechnics like they have now in churches. It was just old Southern Baptist dudes preaching long sermons and there were no iPads right? And there was no cell phones to play on. (laughs) There were books and coloring books, you know, I can remember. And we would take our little uh, kids classics books and we would read Tom Sawyer or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or we'd color or whatever. I remember that was the first time we're like, man, three hours is a long time for a five-year-old to sit through (laughs) a church service and be totally silent. Yeah. I mean, I remember those really well. I actually think growing up in that way probably had an effect in training us to be able to focus for longer periods of time. The thing that I noticed in my adult life, we did a podcast on this earlier, was the Pomodoro. The Pomodoro is one of the first places where when you're working and you need to get something done, you notice what your mind's tendency is to jump around and do other stuff. Sure. Right? It's like that itch to go pull up your email and see who sent you something or, you know. I just got the itch just now when you said it. I was like, ooh, I wonder if somebody's emailed me about the federal stimulus package or something, you know, you're like, yeah, can I wait another 20 minutes till the podcast is over? Okay. I will, you know? Yeah. What that grew into for me, I wouldn't necessarily say everybody needs to do, but I think there's some interesting stuff in here. Pomodoro's helped me understand that I could get way more done in a shorter period of time, which would give me more. First of all, it made me feel better. In my day, I was like, look at all I got done. Yeah. I felt great. I could stop working and I could feel good about the fact that I stopped working because I did a ton of stuff. That 
bled into a whole other area, which is, you know, it got really popular for a while. I think it's still somewhat popular. Actually, Barbell Logic sent out a really good email recently about several things you can do for your own mental health during this yep. coronavirus pandemic. There were a couple of things in there that were really helpful to me. I read 10% Happier, which was one of the books that was recommended, and it was fantastic. And that got me onto the world of doing a little bit of meditation and not the spooky kind, nothing spooky. Sure. I'm not levitating, nothing right. weird like that. Mindful stuff, focused on breathing yeah, and things like mindfulness that. Mindfulness stuff. And that work for me really clarified my brain's tendency to hop around yeah. and not be able to focus on one thing for an extended period of time. And what you really learn there is the actual thing you're doing, at first at least, and this is not necessarily related to meditation, mostly just making sure that you're able to pay attention to whatever it is you're doing, is to ignore everything else. Yeah. Basically, when you're having a conversation with someone, the rudest thing you can possibly do, and I will just stand on this, I don't care how important you think you are with the exception of maybe if you're in the medical profession or something, if you're talking to someone and you're having a conversation with them, don't look at your phone right. every three minutes. Don't be texting people in the middle of that. It just, it makes it to where everything about the quality of the conversation you're having with somebody else has diminished. Has died. Right? It makes them feel unimportant. I mean, and you're not getting everything out of it for sure because you're switching gears. I stopped wearing my Apple watch for that very reason. So I thought, how great is this when I first got the Apple watch? Because it just gave me that little tiny pulse on my wrist. And I was like, I don't have to pull my phone out of my pocket and see who texted me or sent me a Slack message. Do you know how much worse it is? that The thing about the phone is I'd turn the phone on, do not disturb, put it in my pocket. If I'm having a conversation with somebody, I could check it 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, half an hour later, whatever. With the watch, it was constantly buzzing. So I would just like, you know, it's a quick glance and you think like, oh, the person I'm talking to doesn't really notice. Oh, they notice. No, they notice. And so I, of course they notice. I don't wear it. It just sits in my drawer next to my bed and I just, you know, if I'm going on a run or something, I want to check my heart rate or something, maybe I'll put it on. But for the most part, I don't wear the thing because I don't like the distractions. I had a period of time there too. Man, I go through ups and downs with this. I am no expert on this topic. This is something we all have to constantly work on and we probably have to regularly revisit it. But in the times where I have family time, this would typically have been during, you know, the time after my kids would get home from school. We're in weird times now and it's not necessarily the case, but I would take my phone and I would put it on my bed stand in my bedroom and I wouldn't pick it up again until the kids went to bed. When that happens, my kids behave better because they're yeah. getting my attention. I'm able to focus on them. I'm happier. It's just so much better of an experience. However, over time, it creeps back in. Sure. And so it takes like these regular intervals to check, like, you know, is there anything so critical that I have to know in this moment? Or can I wait and handle this information in batch? Yeah. Well, one of the things we've learned with Pomodoro's is a great example of this, but we're way better, more efficient at batch process. That's right. That's exactly right. We should always focus on one thing and then schedule time to go do whatever else. Like That's if right. you want to surf Reddit and look at all the funny things that are happening on Reddit, I'm not telling you you just can't. put it on the schedule. I'm just saying don't do it all day. Pick a time where you're going to yeah. spend 15 minutes surfing Reddit and laughing at all the funny videos that are out there. That's fine. Yeah. But all of this goes to the idea that our brains, again, this is a topic we've touched on before, but our brains do not do two things at once. Right. They don't. We can context switch. Some people can context switch faster than others, but all of us are terrible at it. This idea that emerged sometime in the 90s that the best workers in the world are multitaskers was totally false. That's right. We now have really, really good science behind why that was totally fake. That's not a thing. Yep. No one can multitask. If you think you can, you can't you might be able to switch gears a little faster, bit faster than, than some people. people. I've yeah. met people that are pretty good at this and I'm not one of them, but you are so much more efficient if you focus on one thing at a time and you choose to transition thoughtfully to something else that actually matters rather than sort of passively go through your day, checking email 6,000 times, Slack 6,000 times, Reddit a bunch of times, you know, whatever it is. You're yeah, you know, there's really two sides of this coin. One is the strategies for how to pay attention, as you mentioned in the introduction, but then equally as such, what you've been talking about is also the ability to ignore the other stuff, right? And they certainly work together, but they're really like two sides of the coin. And so we have to figure out how can we better focus on the thing, the task at hand, while at the same time, because it benefits, number one, ignoring all the other stuff, right? And so I'd like to walk through a little bit of sort of practical things that we've done. And some of these, I don't want to overlap the Pomodoro stuff too much. There is obviously, to me, a Pomodoro done in the correct room 
at the right time is sort of like the perfect scenario, right? You go into a private office or a private room, a library, you shut the door, you turn the phone off, you turn the notifications off, and you do the 25 minutes of undistracted work. And by the way, if you've never done that, that's where you should start. You should do it that way first. But I think one of the things, you know, you said that you're not an expert at this and you're not great at this, but I actually think this is one of those things that you and I, both from a combination of our personality, our genetics are sort of wired to be better at focusing and getting shit done. And also because of that, we have then spent a lot of time trying to get even more efficient at it that I think both of us are pretty good at it better than most. It's one of the things I think I'm most naturally good at is to just be able to focus and get a tremendous amount of work done in a short period of time. My staff, when I'm going out to my leadership team, they're like, how would you do that? Like, how could you? And I'm just like, I just, you know, when I get my mindset on like, here we go, it's work time, then I do it. And so, and I don't do that all the time. And actually during the, some of this quarantine, I've been a little more distracted about those sort of things too. Like I'm pulling up Twitter and I'm reading the newest article or whatever. But the question is when you have less than optimal conditions, you know, you and I have traveled a lot, not right now because everything's closed, but learning how to focus. And I get so much work done on an airplane. Airplanes are loud. There's people everywhere, constantly interrupting your work. And I still get tons of work done. Why? I frequently forget all the details of what happened on the flight beyond the work. That's right. Work for me usually is reading or whatever. Maybe sometimes some of the boards I'm on or whatever, I've got something to do. But on, on for the computer. most part, yeah, it's just reading. And I get done with you know the whole trip and I think, oh, that was a really great book I read through whatever the flight. <laughs> I don't know any of the details of the flight. I don't remember the airport that I walked through if I had a connecting yeah, airport. Sure. And a big portion of that is how well you can focus. Focusing on something and ignoring everything else also does include, and we have talked about this before, but it includes noticing the different things that cause you distraction and finding ways to block them out. So yep. for me, sound, sound is number one. That's right. And that's not the case for everybody. Sure. Some people, it's really visual. Like yep. if they see a lot of things going on out in the world, it's very difficult for them to pay attention. For me, sound is like happening at 20 times the decibels for me than it is for everybody else. I'm convinced because I'll hear some little trickle of sound. and I'll be like, what is that? Right. And it, you know, it just drives me nuts. And I learned our dad was this way. He was so crazy sound sensitive through our childhood. And on one of the fishing trips that Matt and I took him on, I asked dad, I was like, you know, wouldn't life have been a lot more fun for you if you would have just walked around with earplugs on all the time? Like just put earplugs in your ears. And then, you know, rather than try to keep the world from making noise, you just keep the noise from entering your ears. And he was like, he said, man, I really wish I would have you know, done that yeah, right. when I was younger. Right. But I have boxes of earplugs. When the yeah. world gets too loud for me, I should put earplugs in. Yeah. I'm the same way with noise canceling headphones. And, you know, actually, we got dad in his last maybe 18 months or so before he had to go to hospice, we got him noise canceling headphones. And some of my most precious videos of our dad is me sort of sneaking around the corner and videoing dad singing songs, like singing Eagle songs or Credence or something, you know, and he's just singing along and he has no idea that anyone else exists because he's got noise canceling headphones on. They're playing the music in his ears. And so same thing for me. I'm always using those noise canceling headphones. I've got to block out the sound. I cannot work in a room where there's a TV on and people are having conversations unless I've got earplugs in or, you know, earplugs and noise canceling headphones like we do. So that sound is a big thing for me for sure. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. There was a point in time where I could do so many Pomodoros, it was crazy. I mean, I just got to where life was Pomodoros. To be perfectly honest, that was not a fantastic life for me. I got a lot of work done in that time frame, right. but I'm not sure that I did a lot of connecting with other people. Sure. But I did notice that if I started Pomodoros with earplugs in, and I did maybe two Pomodoros with earplugs in, I could take them out and then everything was still fine. Interesting. My brain became so attuned to what I was doing that my mind was blocking noise out at that yeah. point. But to start with, I couldn't do it. Yeah. So that's another, that's just a good trick to help you stay focused. The other thing that I'd say is, you know, the books that you all recommended recently, I thought it's so good. There's a lot that's in there around the idea of meditation, mindfulness meditation, and just learning how to focus that helps you learn what things are causing the distraction, how to recognize them and not let your brain trail off on them for very long. Yep. So part of it is, you know, you can notice a sound and then just sort of notice it and go, wow, that's that right. was a sound. But you don't have to necessarily get up and go track down the sound and do all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of good training for your brain in this idea behind ignoring things that don't matter and focusing on things to do. And meditation is definitely a big help there if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, I started using Headspace maybe 18 months ago or so. And Headspace is a great place to start because it's really simple. 
and it's free for, I don't know, the first month or something. I mean, you don't even have to put a credit card on file. You can just test the thing out. Guy's got a great, relaxing British voice. You know, I actually listened to a podcast. I think how I built that podcast and it was with those guys. And that guy was actually one of the guys. He just happened to also have like this guy who was really into meditation and like yoga and stuff also just happened to have one of the most calming, relaxing voices of all time. But, you know, I've used his stuff. I've used Sam Harris's stuff before. And really the point of most of that stuff of that sort of non-spiritual, non-religious meditation is about like being very mindful about what your thoughts are thinking about. And so the idea of I'm focusing on my breath, it was really what it is. I mean, a lot of times they'll allow even those good meditation apps or, you know, ways of studying will allow the distraction will actually tell you to think about something else for a second and let that thought come in your mind and leave and then get right back to focusing on your breath in and out, count the breath. Like they'll do things like that that you don't have to do after you've done it for a while in the beginning you're counting like... Breathe in one, breathe out two, breathe in three, breathe out four. Well, you do that for me. Here's the interesting thing about Headspace. Headspace is made to be sitting in a chair, like do it early in the morning. It's supposed to kind of clear out your head and help you like be able to focus better. I will fall asleep 100% of the time on Headspace. If I'm sitting in, a, like maybe if I'm sitting in a dining room chair, my office chair, I'd be okay. But I loved it for just even, I'll take a nap sometimes in the afternoon, about two or three times a week, maybe I'll take a nap in the afternoon. And often I have work to do after the nap. I need to be able to like push out all the distractions, let my body rest. And I work very well after sleep. I'm not one of those guys that wakes up in the morning or even after a nap groggy. I wake up and I'm like, let's go. It's time to work. But I do struggle sometimes with falling asleep or, you know, my brain goes nuts. And so Headspace was perfect for that. I'd lay in bed. I put in the noise canceling headphones. I turn on Headspace and five minutes in, I was asleep because I'm counting my breaths. So it worked great. But you're exactly right. And in the same manner that you learn to focus on your breath, you can learn to focus on the TPS reports or whatever it is, you know, the stuff that's not that fun. And know that the distractions will come and your brain will flip over to one for a second and that's okay. You just sort of notice it and then you go, okay, and it's fleeting, it's gone. Yep. And you go back and focus on the thing that you need to focus on. Right before the coronavirus hit, there was this sort of big social media thing that occurred. Like the world became aware of two groups of people, the people that had an inner dialogue and people that don't. I don't know if you were aware of this at uh -huh. all. Yeah, so there's like some people on yeah. the planet that have no inner dialogue. That don't talk to themselves. Right. And so when they're silent... Unacceptable. They're not talking to themselves. Right. And so for those people, if there's anybody that's listening at this point and has that, everything I have to say does not include you. Right. I know nothing of your world. Right. Also, definitely don't reproduce. <laughs> you should take yourself out of the gene pool for sure. <laughs> but I'll say this. In my head, the voice is so loud. My own internal narrative is so loud that it's hard to get it to quiet down, specifically when I'm trying to sleep, like, sure. like you mentioned before. Sure. And there are some pretty good techniques to help you learn to be able to focus on sleep and do that. But it is all the same concept. And ultimately, this helps us to be able to read. We talked about reading. This helps us to be able to read. When we're focusing on reading, sometimes you find yourself a page and a half in on reading and you've been thinking about something else the sure, whole time. Well, that's not focusing at all. No. So you've got to be able to do that. And really everything we do in life it's important that we're able to focus on that thing, be mindful of the sure. thing we're doing, and then set time aside for the other things that we want to do rather than just jump around. Yeah, that's right. It, isn't it that it's the first page or two pages of a book that once you sit down and read, those are the hardest ones to read because you're in the middle of a context switch. It has to be because you're starting to read again. And I often have to read the first page or the first two pages two or three times in a row before I finally get into that mode. And then you knock out the next 150 pages and never look up but it takes a little while to get in there. And so learning how to pay attention to the thing that matters and ignore the distractions is certainly something that is a trait that can be worked on. It is a skill that can be learned. There are certainly lots of things that we can do to make sure that we help ourselves along the way. We can turn off those distractions on our phone. We can turn off those distractions on our laptop. We can put ourselves in a quiet room. We can get the noise canceling headphones. You can put the blinders on so you can only see the things that are right in front of your face. But Ultimately, there has to be some sort of mindful focus on here's the thing. Like You have to be very intentional about focusing on a thing and ignoring the stuff that doesn't matter. And I think as we do that, I've often thought, I used to joke, this is not, by the way, please don't write me because this is what I used to think back in like the 80s. And I don't know that I think exactly this, but it'll make sense. I remember thinking when I was a kid, like I was 10 or 11, it was like 1989, and a kid would be ADHD. Like I have ADHD. I was like, oh no, that kid just hadn't been spanked enough. Spank you get enough, no more ADHD. Now, <laughs> I'm not advocating beating your children. It's a different world, right? 
But the reality is, is what it was, was my experience with kids at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old in a classroom who couldn't sit in a desk and be quiet, who couldn't focus and do their work was like, that is an undisciplined kid who's never been forced to actually be disciplined and focus on anything, right? And the reality is, is at eight or nine or 10 years old, it's not the kid's fault. It's his mom and dad's fault. It's his teacher's fault. It's the people that were responsible for discipline. But for those of us that are listening to this podcast, we are adults and we can take ownership in disciplining ourselves enough to learn how to do this thing. And so while certainly some of you are going to be more sort of genetically predisposed to be distracted, it doesn't mean that you can't get better at this thing. Was it an interview with Gates and Buffett where they were like, you know, what makes people successful? And both of them basically said the ability to focus and get shit done. <laughs> people who can focus and get work done are the most successful people there are. And they both said it sort of, sort of independently of each other. They were like, it was the same answer for both of them. And so learn how to focus and get shit done. And that's the practical takeaway. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. And you got some stuff you can probably put into play and into practice tomorrow morning. Everybody probably has work to do. Some of you are still at home. A lot of you are probably still at home. And so distractions are greater than when they are at work in your office. And so you've got the opportunity to put some of this in practice and take what you've learned and get better at it. Don't get frustrated with yourself. It's not easy. You're not going to be professional at it in the first day or two that you try this, but it certainly will get better along the way. So thank you for listening. Give us a five-star review if you love what we do, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.